There's a whole lot of interest on this uh, from animal and human medicine, but also for plant protection. So there's a couple experiments that I'll, I'll give you a, a perusal of that we did in the last couple of years making our own concoctions. But um, when you're dealing with uh, the plant primaries, these are the plant primaries, and then down here is what we call the secondary. So if you look at James Duke, Dr. James Duke, he did a com compendium over about a decade of um, about a thousand different plants with three thousand different compounds found in these plants. For example, tomatoes, you know, they found like almost four hundred different compounds in tomatoes. It's probably a lot more than that, but that's, that's where they stopped. And what they're talking about are all these secondary and primary compounds, but a lot of them are these secondary compounds. And these are compounds that plants make for a variety of reasons, including pollination. So the fragrances, molecular signals down in the root ball to attract beneficials that are going to attack not so beneficials. So it's perfume, it's color. And 1% of the PSMs are volatile, and there's 90 plant families with over 1,700 volatiles that they've actually examined. And so they're called terpenoids or terpenes. Another word for that is essential oils. They happen to be cousins to the carotenes. And then there's the phenylpropanoids, and these are kind of in the flavonoid family. And then there's the fatty acid derivatives, and there's the amino acid derivatives. So there's all these compounds that plants make to protect themselves. And what's great about this is that unlike a pesticide or an antibiotic, which comparatively speaking is a fairly uh, simple molecular group, uh, the plant secondary metabolites that are emitted by plants are incredibly and vastly complex. And the reason why they're so important is because if this is the pest here, and this is a cell membrane, these are all the what we call the organelles within that cell that are affected by plant secondary metabolites. So the mitochondria, the furnace is affected, the enzyme systems, the channels or ion channels, the trans transporters, the signal inductors, the cell membrane, all of these locations on that, on that test target site are affected by plant secondary metabolites. So what that says is, first of all, if you're using a cocktail of plant secondary metabolites, and plants make cocktails, by the way, or you're making a cocktail, you have a huge variety of molecules being able to target a huge variety of targets. So what does that mean? It means that resistance is futile. <laughs> That's what it means. The pest has a hard time building resistance because there's just too many ways that that organism can be shut down. Pollination is, you know, absolutely essential. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is it's not just the honeybee that is a primary pollinator, but even your bats and mosquitoes, or mossies as you call them. Mice, ants, beetles are probably the biggest group of pollinators, beetles. Um, birds, wasps, butterflies, uh, miscellaneous mammals. There's a lot of guys that are involved in romance. Pollinators perceptions. It's a function of the number of compounds that come out of the blossoms. It's, it's relative to the concentrations, the intensity of the combined scent or the bouquet. You know, the bouquet is like a complex smell. That has a lot to do with it. The memory that that particular pollinator has of the odors. And flowers produce species-specific signals to increase foraging efficiency. So in other words, plants know how to seduce their pollinators. That's what it comes down to, if they're healthy, if they're healthy. Honeybees can distinguish between cultivars within a species. So a scent can consist of one to 100 volatiles. Usually it's in the neighborhood of 20 to 60 volatile substances. And honeybees use all the volatiles to discriminate subtle differences. And that's one of the reasons why I think having a lot of variety in your farm can actually be a very good educational tool for the pollinators because they get to choose. I mean, I've seen this where I've grown buckwheat, which I always thought was the best pollinator for honeybees. And it was not really attractive to honeybees because I actually found out that my buckwheat was flowering at the time when other pollinating uh, species were blooming, and they actually preferred to pollinate the non-buckwheat species. Gemotherapy is buds, right? So this is a form of medicine in France called gemotherapy. And so the resin that's produced by the bud when it's dormant is actually loaded with these compounds that make up the raw materials for one of the best, in my opinion, medicines for insects 
uh, or animals, and that's called propolis or propolis. Anybody ever use propolis for a sore throat medication? Man, that stuff is fantastic. I mean, it just always works. And that's because it's incredibly complex and it's loaded with these resinous compounds of bees. It's called a bee glue. Anybody keep bees here? Yeah. So you know about propolis. You chew it once in a while? Yeah. yeah. Interesting work done on medicine, on propolis. All these particular medicinal anti-ulcer, bacterial, viral, fungal, inflammatory. This is a plant secondary metabolite composite. If you do have, now you don't have varroa mites here yet. Is that what I heard? And you don't have tracheal mites here yet either? Tracheal, they attack, they attack the trachea. You don't have those here yet? No? Well, we have both. Plus, we have colony collapse disorder, thank you. <laughs> you know, and we're in bad shape in the United States with bees. I mean, we're losing, you know, 30% a year. And there's only so far you can go with 30% attrition before you got it. They're going to have a big honeybee shortage this year in the almond country of California. They don't have enough bees. They just know that now. What's that? In terms of the ind indigenous bees, you mean, or just the almonds? More the, the, collapse the, of the, the collapse of the honeybee industry or the conventional honeybee industry? The, the almond industry. Almond industry, yeah. Well, the thing is, we need bees for more than almonds, mm -hmm. you know? But I think maybe it will take such a collapse and such a lucrative business for people to then make it. Might, uh, it might, so, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's that old grandfather saying, you know, the good news is wrapped up in the bad news kind of thing. So sometimes we don't do anything until we react to a crisis. but. You know, I, and I think that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of focus now on the indigenous pollinators because they're in jeopardy and we've ignored them. We don't even understand them because the honeybee is really a, it's not a native to North America. It's, a, it's an alien species. It's brought over here, but it's incredibly aggressive. As a matter of fact, uh, there's some interesting research done on the, um, the colonies, the first colonies in the 17th century in North Carolina. Uh, or where, where they brought bees with them, you know, and, and they actually felt that the bees created a lot of disruption for the native pollinators there, w actually created food shortages for the Native Americans, believe it or not. I mean, that was what pretty... What they call it? The, 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 yeah, they called it something. Say what? They called it the stinging wasp or something, didn't they? The natives. They called it the stinging wasp, yeah, yeah. right. Although they're, they're pretty, I mean... The Caucasian bees are nicer than the Italian bees. It should be the other way around. I don't know why they call them the Italian bees, <laughs> but, you know, the Caucasian bees are supposedly easier going. I don't know. But here, here's, a, here's a recipe that's been used with a great deal of success on these mites. So it's 25 drops, which is about a milliliter of cc of oil of wintergreen to a pint or half a liter of honey. And you take 25 drops the same of lecithin to emulsify the oil. Add it to a quart jar, fill the other half with water, a liter jar, and you can also use these other essential oils. And they, you just put it out free choice and let them have at it. And, when, and it seems to build an immunity uh, to, these, to these mites. Or you can make a, basically a, a wet t-shirt party for the bees, you know? So you basically take uh, four cups of sugar, cane sugar, not high fructose corn syrup sugar, by the way, which is what they're feeding the bees. It's one of the reasons why I think we're having a lot of issues with the health of the bees. They're taking all their honey, which is an incredibly complex uh, energy source. It's loaded with amino acids, fatty acids, minerals, vitamins, unidentified factors of many kinds, and giving them high fructose corn syrup. And you wonder why you have a, oh, I mean, we know high fructose corn syrup does to us. So you don't use that. Use some cane sugar, and then you just take, again, about a milliliter or 25 cc's, excuse me, about an ounce of essential oils, mix it with four ounces of the patties, put two patties on top of the brood box. They seem to kind of like swim through this stuff. They just coat themselves up with it, and it, it actually bathes them in these uh, phytoalexins or these plant secondary metabolites, and it kills the mites. It's amazing. So plants, I don't care what kind of plant you're growing, there is this incredible system going on here where you have Alleliopathy, how many people know what alleliopathic influences are? Like you have a black walnut, you know, there's a, a number of chemicals that are exuded out of the roots so that other plants uh, don't do very well growing around the root ball. But it's also done because these are strong antifungal agents. A lot of those alleliopathic compounds are what they call alkaloids. Alkaloids are dumped a lot in the root ball. And alkaloids are really good against things like nematodes and uh, root fungi. Um, when a, a plant is hit by a, a pest, you start getting signals, uh, and these signals are basically um, initiated by a 
protein molecule that comes from the pest. And this protein molecule then starts a cascade of an immune reaction, just like if you get um, infected. You know, there's an immune response. It's called a phytoalexin response. I'll talk about that a little bit. That starts revving up uh, communication molecules like jasmonic acid and salicylic acid, which is another word for aspirin, right? to start revving up these phytoalexin compounds and then start going to the site of the, uh, of the infection or the attack. So these are wound signals. They call them green leaf volatiles. Those are other signals. And so all of these, there's communication going on in the root, in the canopy, and especially to other plants that have not yet been attacked. That might be the most impressive part of the plant secondary metabolite phenomena is the communication downstream, and I'll show you some slides that verify that. Uh, the silkworm is a model. Somebody was telling me, Bonnie, you were telling me, where is she, Bonnie? Uh, is she still here? Or is she out doing things? But she's talking about the, the wasp that you guys are going to be using as a parasitical wasp that has... Um, Anastatus? Right, but they're going to use silkworm eggs yeah. as the host, so they can actually import. That's interesting to me, yeah. But, you know, silkworms, actually, the silkworm industry was attempted in uh, Georgia back, way back in the 1700s, and it flopped, collapsed, primarily because they were trying to move the larvae into um, houses that were made out of bald cypress. All right? Bald cypress is what? Taxodium. It contains this uh, furaldehyde, which is a growth inhibitor at a mere one part per million. So that tree... Vapor actually was a plant secondary metabolite insecticide that killed all the silkworm larvae just by hosting, you know, those silkworm larvae in a 17th century uh, brooding house. So the dilemma of plants is grow or defend. What do you think they're going to do first? Defend. <laughs> can't defend, can't grow. Right. Photosynthesis, when everything's going right, you know, you've got lots of adequate amounts of nitrogen. Okay, now we're talking about the funny protein thing again here. Keep that in mind. We can make these things called terpenoids, the essential oils. And if it's limited, then the first place that those nitrogen compounds are going to be utilized is in the roots. Without a root, there's no top. And then the nitrogen is used to make alkaloids. Alkaloids are very rich in nitrogen. You know, most of your alkaloids uh, are nitrogen-rich compounds. So it goes to the root first if you're deficient for the whole plant to have adequate amounts of nitrogen. When there's enough nitrogen, the next, the next bouquet comes along, then it can start sending some to the uh, young shoots because they're very vulnerable. And they're getting what? Terpenoids, essential oils. So complete nutrition plays a role in all of this. Too much nitrogen, what does that do? It shuts down the actual complete protein process, and you end up with a deficiency of alkaloids and or terpenoids. So disease resistance in higher plants, they're basically in four groups. So before they're infected, there's things called prohibitins and inhibitins. After they're infected, they're called post-inhibitins and phytoalexins. So these things in healthy plants are already there, and they're actually uh, the immune system of the plant that disallows organisms to infect them. And if they happen to become infected, and they're still strong enough to ward it off, then they come up with these other immune responses. I'll call them like plant antibodies, if you want to call it something similar to what animals respond to. Plant antibodies are the post-inhibitants and the phytoalexins. This is an example of a pre-infective response with a number two. This is an inhibitin. This is uh, a potato that they cut lengthwise for late blight. Phytophthora infestans, 14 days at 18 degrees C. There's the site of the infection, rotting infective tissue. So they find out that this phenol, called coumarin, increases up to 20 times. Another phenol, called chlorogenic acid, is also found where? In coffee. Chlorogenic acid is a really important uh, antioxidant. That's why it's good for people, by the way. Coffee has more antioxidants than any other beverage, by the way. That's why I like a little bit of it, yeah. Hydrocinnaminic acid increases 300%. Similar phenolic increases. And, and, and one, one of the things that's great about coffee is caffeine is an alkaloid. Anything that ends with the word "-ine", like nicotine, that's an alkaloid. Good insecticide, right? Caffeine is a good sluggocide. Sluggocide, right? 
So these phenolics are produced after you know, the process st starts. Uh, bird's foot trefoil, that's a legume. And legumes um, are very susceptible to mildews. They produce this cyanogenic glycoside. What's that word you see there? Cyanide, right? So legumes produce cyanide because, and all of them do, string beans, soybeans, because they're very susceptible to powdery mildew. So here you're talking about an enzyme that converts the, the cyanogenic glycoside into a much more potent cyan cyanide right here that actually kills the, the mildews. Okay, so this is uh, management of late blight with alternative products. This was a scientific paper that was produced. Some were as plant extracts, what I mean by that, so they, they made a water infusion or an alcoholic extract or they did an essential oil. It was a different one. So these are some of the plants that they used. Um, crucifers, so we're talking now downy mildew on crucifers. What they found out is some of the heirloom varieties had very high levels of this what? Glucosilinate, that's a sulfur compound. Glucosilinates are extremely healthy for animals and people to eat because they are what they call liver conjugates. That means they detoxify the liver. It's interesting how these compounds can go across, you know, animal and plant species with similar objectives, you know, in that getting rid of the got bad guys, all right? So this, this one that has 630 micrograms per gram of this glucosilinate was very resistant. This was an heirloom variety. This was a new hybrid variety. So what are they saying is that the old varieties, we've lost a lot of the innate plant protective compounds that are in there uh, for the purpose of size, faster growth. Um, some University of Texas work uh, talks about, you know, nutrient density disappearing and one of the reasons why, besides what we've done to our soils and what we've done to our soil biology, as well as our soil mineral uh, composites, is they've actually hybridized things so things grow faster and bigger. Well, in, in the process of making a plant that grows faster and bigger, you get what's known as the dilution effect. Because plants are almost only able to take up so much at any given time, and as you force that plant to grow bigger and faster at the same time, it doesn't have the efficient capability of bringing in the nutrient density. And the nutrient density, those minerals in particular, are the raw materials to make these things. You can't make those plant secondary metabolites unless you have the mineral nutrition coming up. So the heirloom variety sometimes in and of themselves have this particular innate ability. This is an interesting experiment they did called the onion bait and switch. So here's the sulfur bearing amino acids. Enzymes turn them into this dialyl disulfide, one of these medicinal sulfur compounds that make garlic so medicinal for animals and people. Allicin is another one. There's a whole variety of them, but this dialyl sulfide actually is a a, a, a deterrent to onion pest, with the exception, and this is called the coevolutionary arms race, with the exception of the sclerotorium uh, infection. So what happens is they, they, the, the sclerotoria will germinate in the presence of the sulfide and the absence of the host. So what they do is they actually basically allow this onion to be in the ground, take it out, and the disease shows up and there's nothing it for to eat and it just wipes the disease right out because it's, it's, it starves itself. So it was an interesting how, um, for example, cabbage loopers. How many people know what cabbage loopers are, right? I mean, they're a, a prevalent broccoli and cabbage pest, the, the green worm. So they seem to be attracted to the, the, uh, the um, PSMs in the brassicas, the sulfur compounds, the glucosilinates, they're attracted to those when everybody else is repelled by it. So they've learned how to evolve by saying, not only are you not going to kill me, uh, but I'm confined you now with this other deterrent that everybody else seems to have an issue with. But guess who else is attracted to this particular disulfide? That's why I don't remove their nests. Wasps. Wasps. Right, pow. So I get, I, around my 6,000 square foot garden, I've got big paper wasp hornets, and people say, oh my God, why don't you take care? They don't bother me. I'm not edible, you know? As long as I don't go and punch the, you know, the house down. I leave them alone, they leave me alone, but I watch them out in the garden, and they're nailing all my cabbage loopers. They're attracted to the same emissions that the cabbage loopers are. So as long as I have predators, you know, 
I'm going to win that war. And if I don't, I can always use some other kind of organic interference, but you can see how that whole system is working. So apple resistance varieties, here we go again, same thing with the different apple varieties. It's the same thing as with the, uh, um, the cabbage varieties. So here's some post-effective phytoalexins. Now phytoalexins is the last responder. These are the guys like when you finally have problems, the phytoalexins are the 911 responders. This is like st stage four of the immune system kicking in. The other three are, aren't getting the job done, the phytoalexins kick in. So these are all examples of these I'm not even going to mention them to you in terms of names. Benzoic acid is the easiest one to pronounce. Uh, Passatin is another one, brown rot fungus, and so forth. But these are all last-minute 911 responders for an infection. But again, you have to remember that you can't build these things unless you've got nutrition. You can't build them. So often the reason why you have crop failure is simply because maybe you have weak hybrids, so there's an innate genetic thing there, or you might have weather stresses, too much rain, too much drought, that allow, this allows nutrition to be taken up into the vascular system of the plant to make these finished compounds, or you don't have enough in the soil to begin with. So the coevolutionary arms race, phytoalexins, plant first responders, produce it in quantity, make it fast, produce it timely at the right location, and it must be fat soluble. Why? Because the pest cell membrane is what you're after. Remember that, that circle I showed you, how all the sites are on that pest cell membrane? So it's got to be a fat-soluble poison or drug or whatever you want to call that thing you know, that plant's making. It's got to be fat-soluble because the pest has got a fat-soluble membrane. Legumes, defense by hormones. So isoflavones, I mean uh, isoflavonoids. Flavonoids, they're in the flavonoid family. What else is in the flavonoid family? Hesperidin, rutin. These vitamin C compounds, flavonoids, and these are considered what? Phytoestrogens, right? So these are used by medicinal practitioners for balancing estrogens. If uh, females are low in estrogens, this is a good way to get a not harmful synthetic estrogen. It's a phytoestrogen. And so it, it, it's a steroid mimicker and it interferes with the nutrition of the fungus and it affects the cell membrane's permeability. So all legumes have these hormones. And if you look at, this is interesting to me because the most potent isoflavones, there's isoflavan, isoflavan is produced by the so most sophisticated of all the legumes, which is who? The lotus. You know, the sacred legume of legumes. Produces the most potent, which is maybe one of the reasons why the lotus is recognized for being what it is. Systemic activated resistance, all right, so this is part of how the thing works. The synthesis is immediate, it can be detected within an hour, and it peaks within two to three days. So once it gets bit, there's a, um, uh, a systemin protein that's initiated, you know, by this biting of the insect, and that saliva contains this protein, and there's a feedback loop system that starts kicking in. The systemin is a signature protein that causes now the genes to suddenly change. Expression, expression of the genes switches get turned off, and jasmonic acid acts like a prostaglandin, which is a uh, hormonal substance that animals uh, utilize in order to express healthy gene expression or a reaction. So jasmonic acid kicks in. That's modulated by what? Salicylic acid. It's one of the reasons why they've done some experiments with salicylic acid as a foliar spray, and it seems to help give plants more resistance. Can you use synthetic salicylic acid or just the stuff you can extract from, like, willow? The chemistry of the plant is involved with changing so that the plants can protect themselves from overgrazing, and I got some examples of wild animals doing this, and uh, cows are involved in that whole cascade. Yeah, you de definitely change the, uh, uh, the chemistry of the plants where overgrazing is actually halted in many ways by uh, the actual phytochemistry of the plant radically changing where there's more tannin produced, there's more alkaloids produced. Uh, these are salicylic rich vet vegetables, so when your doctor says take aspirin or baby aspirin to keep your blood thin, it's completely a worthless attempt because salicylic acid is not just salicylic acid if you take it as aspirin, it's called acetyl. A-C-E-T-Y-L, salicylic acid. It causes hemorrhaging. It causes blood letting. And salicylic acid that's found in nature doesn't have that acetyl group. 
So if you want to get aspirin in your blood, and these researchers did this on Tibetan monks that were vegetarians that ate a lot of vegetables, these are salicylic acid rich vegetables that don't have any downside to them. You won't end up with stroke or, or ulcers. And these are the fruits. You notice the dark color? Berries, the dark berry colors. These are rich in salicylic acid. Odor blends of attacked plants. Ah, over 200 separate compounds. It directly affects herbivores' behavior. It attracts the enemies of the attacking herbivores, like predatory mites, parasitical wasps, hornets, like I just mentioned on the cabbage looper. So these compounds are messengers. They're messengers, right? Release of stored plant compounds, which are the post inhibitants again. So now we actually have a, an insecticide that's being released. And we have a biosynthesis of new volatile compounds that weren't there in the first place. This is the uh, uh, stage four, 911 kicking in. And this is interesting. Predators can distinguish infestations by its host herbivores from non host herbivores. So they know that that plant is attacked, and that same species over here is not. They don't waste any time. So what you can do, this is an example of uh, some USDA studies. You can actually, if you want, they found out here, they clipped sagebrush release volatiles near cultivated tobacco plants. And they increased the mortality of young Manduca sexta caterpillars merely by taking sage, wild sage that was growing near the tobacco plants, and damaging them physically <coughs> by clipping them, releasing volatiles. So what does that tell me? tells you you can take volatile substances that you can make on your own and wafe them over your plants. And we've done this uh, last year up in New York State on tomatoes. When late blight came in, we made a, a mixture of uh, essential oil mixtures with that phyto guard I'll talk about here in a little bit. And as long as we were preventatively treating the tomatoes, this was the only guy in the neighborhood that didn't get clobbered with late blight. He, he sailed right through late blight and all of his neighbors collapsed with it. Because when that stuff, it's like AIDS when that stuff hits. I mean, it's, once, it, once it attacks, it's pretty hard to, to turn it around. But he, he kept his tomato patches you know, intact merely by preventatively spraying volatiles on those plants in effect creating some kind of immune, innate, innate immune response in that tomato plant where it did not come down with the phyto, a phyto excuse me, with the um, phyto. Some sort of sprayed it with a, with a, a pack pack sprayer. So yeah. Just made a, a I gave him some. It was essential oil uh, solution in a, in a surfactant and he just put in a, a one or two percent dilution in the water cool. and just sprayed it. And that was the end of it. And he did it not once, though. He did it like every seven to ten days. Yeah. Because he heard what happened was late blight hit the southern part of the United States, and everybody knew it was coming north. So he had some time to go out there and prophylactically prepare his tomatoes with it. And so it was a couple of weeks before it finally got up to the Finger Lakes of New York State. We get it every spring and summer. Every spring and summer. Spring. Right. It's late blight. Yeah. Right. And this is just the same species that's in the roots of your avi trees too? Different species. Different species. Yeah. Right, okay, that's what I thought. I'd have to be. Yeah. All right, so this is some trials I did with a guy up in Canada with this similar product. We put together a, a concoction called PhytoGuard, which we called it. And uh, this was on, uh, now this was on conventional, and I hate these kind of trials because these are potted plants grown with chemistry in greenhouses, you know? Everything that I wouldn't do. <laughs> but that was the trial. So we said, okay, if it works on that, probably works on a lot of other things. But I don't like those trials because it doesn't take in consideration, you know, good soil issues like biology and chemistry. And it doesn't take into consideration, you know, cultural practices. These are conventional Lebanese cucumbers grown in pots on trellises. You'll see them here. And um, so this was on two spotted spider mites, which are pretty tough to kill, with a 1% dilution. These are the dates of application. August 16th, 25th, September 3rd, and 13th. And we had 100% results, as long as we got in there before the pest. And we put a, um, a polymer on there called Extend. This is not for um, erectile dysfunction, by the way, guys. This, this is just a polymer to keep it wrapped around the, uh, the plant. And so this, this was on downy mildew, and we also had really good results um, after a 15% infestation of downy mildew already began. So I didn't think it would work that well because the infestation was already underway, but um, 
This is what it looks like starting out. You see the backpack sprayer in those greenhouses is September 6th. And uh, this is the treated September 28th. And this is the control. It's, a, it's got about, um, I'd say, eight different essential oils in there. And it's got a, a castor oil base. And it's got some organic surfactants in it. And the, uh, the Extend is a, an organically approved polymer that they use for foliar sprays uh, so that uh, nutrients stay on the leaf without rolling off. That's what it is, yeah. It did it on black sooty mold on uh, scale, from scale. This was on uh, the treated scale. Very effective on scale, which is a tough pest. Scale's not easy to get rid of. This is on magnolia trees. You guys have magnolias down here? Yeah? On peony, on botrytis. These were the applications on that. This is typical, very common. It doesn't usually kill the peonies, but it was nice to see that we could get rid of uh, botrytis on peonies. Uh, we just check sensitivity insect by insect. This was not an actual field trial. This was an insect by insect trial. So we did them on all these particular pests at those dilution rates, and they were effective on all these pests in that dilution rate. So this was um, number of dead eggs. This was a certified consultant in Quebec, Canada, that did this research. And I won't spend a lot of time, but these were different half a percent, um, half a percent, one and a half percent, two percent, one percent. This was a, another variation of Phytogarb. We called it Phyto Plus, just different combinations. The first application, by reducing the adults, we also reduced the egg number. So here's the untreated check. And so the egg numbers weren't reduced, but you see. Uh, what happens here, this is the uh, forbid insecticide, the conventional treatment. You can see that had the highest control, although we weren't far apart on this one and this one and this one. So we did knock, you know, the, the adults back to the point where the egg levels just, and the consultant called me up, he said, are you sure there's not any kind of chemicals in this stuff? And I said, no, there isn't. Why are you asking me? He says, we've never seen these organic insecticides work on killing the eggs, frying the eggs. He said, this fries the eggs. Um, and this was on uh, dead mites. So again, the same thing, we compare it to forbid. You know, we, at, at the very end, we end up with similar results. Not quite as good as the forbid, but good enough, you know. And this was on the uh, powdery mildew and percentage of infected leaves. So you can see what happens is right here, the untreated check, you're starting to see the, the percentage go way up to 70%. On the phytoguards, you know, they drop down here. And what this says right here, there should have been another treatment if you wanted to keep it going. Right about in here, um, because all the levels were down, very low compared to Nova um, in this, a, a fungicide at 5%. So it's, it's, it's very encouraging to see these, these kinds of phytoalexins being produced. Number of spots from Mattery Mill do the same thing as with the, uh, the amount of damaged leaf surfaces. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Copper, this is just an example. Adequate amounts of copper create this polyphenol oxidase. So biosynthesis of lignin. Where do you want lignin? In your roots. Why? Tree bark protects plants in the root ball from nematodes and fungal diseases. But you can see all of these things that are associated with just one mineral, copper, but not excessive copper, <laughs> right? And you can see here, what's happening here is we're getting all these flavonoids being produced out of the root zone. And we're getting amino acids and sugars produced out of the root zone. So the root ball is an amazingly uh, manufacturing plant of all of these compounds, as well as the terpenoids that are coming out of the canopy. And of course, the plant secondary metabolites. This is uh, Huber's work. I want to, you know, I just synops synopsed some of his work out of the, one of the textbooks. But you can see all of these minerals are all associated with, you know, preventing diseases. Um, and I showed you this slide earlier. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Have a great time. Appreciate it. All right.